Hello, and thank you to everyone for joining us for this very special discussion as we celebrate the 49th anniversary of Title IX. Girls and women's opportunities to participate in sports have grown exponentially since the passage of Title IX, but we've seen the reverse trend for women in coaching and athletic leadership. Today, you will hear from three women who are part of the movement to reverse this trend for women and women of color as they seek to accelerate the pace of change. Adia Barnes, Jennifer King, and Vicki Chun join me, LaChina Robinson, to discuss their journeys so far and their visions for the future. Let's meet our panelists. Adia Barnes led her team to the national championship game last season for the first time in Arizona women's basketball history. Just five short years after starting her first career stint as a head coach at her alma mater, where she graduated as the Wildcats' all-time leading scorer and played 12 professional seasons, including in the WNBA. Barnes made headlines during her team's run this past March because of her unapologetic, authentic coaching style, as well as how she so graciously balanced taking her team to new heights while being a mom of two adorable children. Can you say superwoman? That's Adia. And while we're on that subject, congrats to Adia who just returned, I mean, just returned from Puerto Rico, winning a gold with Team USA's FIBA Women's America Champions. And she did that alongside Dawn Staley just a few months after she and Dawn were the first two African-American women to make it to the same final four. Welcome Adia. Thanks, my first gold. Yay, but it won't be your last. Not my last. <laughs> I'm like, Don, you're used to getting gold. I was like, this is my first. So I was like a little kid in the candy shop. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> you guys did that. And you've got some pretty cool dance moves that I got to see the team yeah. um, executing on social media. So they've got the moves and the game. Uh, next up, Jennifer King is the first African American woman to be named a full time assistant position coach in the NFL. She's an assistant running back coach for the Washington football team. King was also a head women's basketball coach at Johnson and Wales University. She is a recipient of the WSF Scott Pioli and Family Fund for Women Football Coaches and Scouts grant and was a collegiate basketball and softball player. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi, Dawn Lashana. Doing great, good to have you. Next is Vicki Chung. Vicki became the first Asian American woman to serve as a D1 athletic director when she was named AD at Colgate University. Well, she was also at the time the first woman AD at Colgate, by the way. Since 2018, she has served as the athletic director at Yale University. But Vicki didn't want to be the last. So she created the Asian American Pacific Islander Athletics Alliance, which we will learn more about in a few. But please join me in welcoming Vicki Chun to our panel. Welcome, Vicki. Thank you. This is uh, this is quite a panel and I'm total uh, uh, fangirl right now. So this is this is exciting. <laughs> this Me is Vicki. I was like, wow, they're so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> this is quite a panel, which is why I don't read my own bio because it would literally be like 120. Oh, stop. You guys oh, have a stop. Card, so. <laughs> it started with you. Thank you all so much for being here with us today to discuss your journeys as well as your visions for the future. Now let's start with this. There has been a decline in female head coaches of collegiate sports. In 1971, 90% of women's collegiate teams were coached by women. Today, only 41% of women's collegiate teams are coached by women. What trends are you seeing or that you've experienced that might explain why these numbers are declining? Vicki, let's start with you. Uh, that's a great question. And um, I truly remain hopeful too, because I would have never expected um, at this time, we would have someone on our panel who's coaching uh, a professional football team, right? Um, or that in the, the national championship game uh, this year, you know, we had Adia and, you know, it's um, two women's coaches, like in the, in, how many in the, the final four? I think it was um, it two. two. So, yeah, and, I'm, and I'm used to seeing sometimes not none in, in national championship game. So I remain hopeful that we're part of the first um, or the beginning of and not the last. 
but it is a, a trend that I've noticed that as soon as um, coaching women's teams became lucrative, there were more interest from, from men, uh, period. And then, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's interesting too, in terms of when we do do a search, there's quite a number of, there's just 90% of the applicant pool would be men and maybe 10% or fewer women. Um, and we have to do better than that. That doesn't matter um, in terms of the numbers, it, it matters at the final hire. And so those in my position, uh, we really need to be cognizant and um, be goal oriented in in making sure that we have lots of opportunities to give to women in leadership roles. And why do you think that that applicant pool may be smaller for women? Like, why do you think women aren't getting to that point in the interview or candidate process? You know, that's interesting because um, it is, uh, I, I do feel that women feel they have to be absolutely positively uh, in their mind, uh, qualified for the position where I, I might get, you know, uh, a manager from, from Denny's applying for a head coaching position. Um, it, it is really interesting when I do make calls, often they will think that they're not qualified or ready yet. And I, I try to, uh, encourage them that, you know, let, let the, the search committee decide that. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot in the very beginning, um, I realized that you have to really promote and support women um, applying and and feeling that you know they are uh, ready and, and confident to to do what they want to do. Yeah, it's interesting. I once heard that women often feel like or think about the boxes they don't check instead of the boxes that they do check, right? So changing that mentality, not to be thinking about maybe what you don't have for a specific position, but all the ways that you do qualify. Um, Adia, just curious about your journey and what you experienced in getting to where you are um, and, and maybe some of the hurdles you face that might may explain why these numbers are declining. Well, and so it's a little different path for me. Um, I don't feel like I've, I've faced as many, as many hurdles along the way just because I went from playing. I was in Washington. I played pro there and then just got, got the Washington assistant coaching job. So I think that um, the path was a little bit different. But once I got here, I've noticed all the disparities. Um, you know, like at Arizona, there's two women's coaches. So there's myself and there's the... Um, the golf coach, the Lori Ionello, and we're both actually alumni. But, you know, when I look around the room, there are no, for, you know, volleyball, softball, there are no women's coaches. Um, so, um, like Vicki said, I think once it became more lucrative, then men started coming on the side. So, you, you think about years ago when it was 90%, they weren't making any money. You know, the salaries were really low. So, I think it wasn't attractive to come coach women. I think in a lot of situations, a lot of men, they would jump to the men's side if they had the opportunity, but who's hiring? There aren't a lot of Vickies in the world, so kudos to her. Mm -hmm. uh, there, aren't, there aren't women in these big leadership roles. There may be at small schools, but even at, at major universities, there aren't a lot of women and you tend to hire people like you. And I think that's just the trend. So there needs to be more women in leadership, more women going to become an AD. I mean, how many women do you know at a high level that are really kick butt, how many want to become an AD? It's like, they don't even see it to be it. So Vicky, just being the first, um, you know, for, and it's funny, having Vicky on the panel is really uh, amazing to me because during all the final four run, um, I remember everybody saying, oh, first African-American woman, first time two African-American women in the final four. I didn't even know that until later. Um, so I got a DM from someone and they were like, wow, you're lucky. There's never been an Asian woman. I was like, it made me think of that. I was like, you're right. Mm -hmm. There's never, but that would be something to start like, so Asian women, Hispanic, they've never been in it. And it's funny. I just thought that this would have happened many times. I never even thought about it. And yeah, so yeah. Um, if you can't, if you don't see it, you can't be it. So you, we inspire people when we're doing it, but I think there just has to be more, but there needs to be at a lower level, more um, programs, for African-Americans to learn, you know, to, to start coaching from 
players, like something to transition you into coaching, some kind of group, some kind of programs to transition you to become an AD. Maybe you're a player, but you really have a mind for business and you'd be a great administrator, but there's nothing to kind of, to push you in that direction there, because there is no one like you. So you can't aspire to do it. I feel like, so I think there, it has to change at a lower level. So you, you're right. You make a lot of great points from, you know, the diversity of leadership and lack thereof. I remember Muffet McGraw saying in her famous speech at the Final Four a few years ago, you know, it's all about who's in the room making decisions and that people hire people that look like them. Um, and not to say that that has to be the case, right? Because we should all be thinking about how we should have more diversity. But um, if you're not seeing Black women like Dawn Staley and Adia Barnes successful, then maybe you don't know that they can be, right? But you've got to hire give, them. Right. You've got to give them the opportunity first to be able to show what they can do. And I think there's another trend in women's sports. Um, and it starts with us on the media side, right? Like when there is a high profile men's coaching job open, people are going to scrutinize that entire process from beginning to end, right? On the women's side, because folks haven't done their research, they don't know the candidates, they don't know the pipelines, they haven't studied the assistants, then people just say, oh, they hired this coach who's a former player. Okay, great, let's move on. Or they hire this, this guy who coached you know, high school basketball and his daughter plays Division One. Okay, that sounds like a good fit, let's put him in. But there needs to be more media attention and there needs to be more conversation about where these candidates are coming from. You know, was there was there a viable pool? Were there women in the pool for this position where they where they hired a man? Was were there black women? So all those conversations need to happen. Jennifer, I'm curious about your thoughts because you touch on this from a lot of different levels. You're a formal former player, um, played basketball in college, but also obviously now you're coaching men's sports. But as far as the women coaching women aspect of that. What was that thought process like for you when you were choosing your school and when you decide to get into collegiate coaching? Yeah, it was interesting because I never really had um, women coaches, which was weird until I was in college actually. So that, that was never a thought process for me. Like you said, I, I never saw it. So I never thought about it. And um, obviously in college, all four years, I had women's coaches. And when I was uh, became an assistant basketball coach, I coached with guys the whole time. And, you know, when I became a head coach, I was like, I'm going to hire like women. And I didn't get the pool that, you know, that I needed to hire women. I ended up hiring two guys, <laughs> you know, just because they were the best choices for, for what I needed and what we needed as a team. And, you know, I hated it because I wanted to hire women on my staff and just try to diversify my staff. But, um, you know, I hired the best two candidates and they ended up being two guys, which was wild to me. And I thought it would be more interest from women, um, you know, for this position, but it wasn't. So I had to make the, the best decision for, for our team and for our program to do that. So um, I definitely understand the, the pool being a little smaller. And I think, you know, as, as I did talk about developing programs, would be huge um, for people in college or even high school, just to, to you know, let them know that there's so many positions in sport as far as administration go um, and, and coaching roles as well. So um, I think there definitely needs to be some type of pipeline that needs to get started just to expose people to the different positions available. Yeah, I know the WBCA has the So You Want to Be a Coach program. Obviously, the Women's Sports Foundation has the Tar Vanderveer Fund for Advancement of Women in Coaching, as well as the Scott Pioli and Family Fund for Women Football Coaches and Scouts, which you received. So we are seeing some programs coming up, but definitely not enough. And if we drill down a little bit, you know, we talked about women overall, but when we drill down and look at women of color, um, there's a shortage. And I read a quote recently from Dawn Staley um, in GQ magazine, where she said, if you only see white coaches, you don't think that carries weight with young people. Young people want to go to the final four. If a black coach has never been to a final four, their chances of going decreases every recruiting day and people will put them on notice because we got a treacherous business. Um, and a black woman is not the norm. And the numbers support what Don had to say, which was, you know, in 19, 2019, 2020, Division I women's basketball, okay? They had 46% of the student athletes were black. All right, so that's 2019, 2020, 46% student athletes are black, but only 10% of the head coaches were black, 10%. 
So while we've had some really bright moments, like Adia making a national championship game, Don Staley in the final four, both of them last this last season, how can we assure that these young black women who play the sport have an equal opportunity to coach the game? Adia? Wow, you know, I didn't know that statistic. I didn't know it was that low. I, I, thought, I thought maybe like, I, I didn't know that at all. Um, it's just uh, disappointing that in this, um, you know, this year that we're even talking about that. So that was 2019, 2020, just a couple of years ago. Um, it's just amazing to me. And I think it goes back to what Jennifer was talking about. When you're younger as a player, you're only being coached by men. So I remember even kind of feeling that way um, when I was younger until high school and well, until probably college, I was coached by a woman. But through AAU, I always, I sit and I look at that now because I'm aware. So AAU, there are no women coaching. Um, even, you know, we were just overseas at the America. I think there was one female head coach from Canada. It's rare. And so in Europe, it's really rare. But I think that you have to see it to be it for sure. Um, and, you know, you guys are going to be surprised right now. So we, um, I, I was asked in November to be a part of the America team. And so no one knew that, obviously. It wasn't publicized. We ended up, I was fortunate enough to go to the Final Four championship game. But I had already agreed to that. Didn't know until I was like in the training camp, or actually it was after training camp. Didn't know until we were like started to go into this three-week bubble that this was the first time that there were two African-American women. And I didn't, Dawn didn't tell me. I found that out from a, a reporter, a local reporter here that was doing a story. She told me, I was like, really? I was shocked. I thought like with USA basketball, there would have been like black coaches for many years. So it's all, I was shocked. I was like, wow. So first time, um, you know, Dawn's the leader, obviously first black coach, black Olympian coach ever, um, or female, or actually it overall um and then as an assistant me so obviously there's a little bit more pressure you always feel a little bit more pressure and that's sad too because you're like oh for the first we need to win and it's just it shouldn't be like that and I think it's just more shocking to me when you look at the sport like and I would think the same if it wasn't African-American let's say there's a sport let's say lacrosse is 45 50 percent Hispanic I would naturally think there would be more Hispanic leadership just because representation and mentoring, because you can mentor differently. Dawn relates to kids from her background way better than anyone else could because yeah. of similarities. And I think just like we played the game, so we're women, we played. So I would naturally think that there would be more coaches because the players are aspiring to, are aspiring to do what you've done. Yeah. And so it's just kind of shocking to me and it's really sad. It's yeah, that we're talking about that in 2021 and yeah. not a lot's changing. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think it's more sad than anything because oh. when the careers of these women are over, many of them don't even know that it's an option for them. Um, and, and you make another great point about the pressure that women feel, that women of color feel, that once you get that opportunity, it's like, you got to be great. You got to win. You got to you got to check all the boxes. You got to be perfect because you not only have the pressure of being successful for your own team and your own school, but for your race and for women and for everyone that you're trying to bring along the path with you. I want to read a quote um, from a tweet that uh, I pulled off Twitter from John Quill Jones, who um, will be an MVP, I feel, feel like one day in the WNBA, yeah. she plays for the Connecticut Sun, but she said, we need more women's coaches in EuroLeague, EuroBasket, WNBA, and wherever women are playing. All I see is predominantly male coaching staffs and it upsets me. Let women coach women, give them opportunities. And all of you have pretty much hit on that concept of see her, be her. Vicki, I'm just curious for you, who were those role models? Who were those people that you saw that gave you that hope and inspiration that you could one day be where you are? That's a, that's a great question. And um, it both men and women, but when I wanted to get into uh, coaching, um, you know, there was a uh, Jolene Nagel who's at Duke, Peg Bradley Dompas, um, who was the coach at, at UNC and they, um, I, I saw to them, I did want to see someone and I, I took um, um, kind of ethnicity out of it. I just wanted to see women who were um, in those roles. And I always say when I, growing up, I wanted to play soccer, but there was no avenue for me to do that. 
And then I see Debbie Green at USC, Liz Masakian, you know, two Asians uh, at UCLA playing volleyball. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to try my hand at volleyball. Became like a very, very, you know, when you're you're five four, you really, I, I wouldn't suggest, you know, maybe go <laughs> going into volleyball. Um, but I mean, those were my options. And then coaching, I did the same thing. And there were many men that helped me, but for me to finally kind of uh, to take that leap, it did take um, the influence of women and also, you know, organizations like the Women's Sports Foundation, like Women Leaders where I can go and feel comfortable and ask all the questions and that you can. And, you know, I think a part of that trend was, you know, when, when um, there are so many female coaches, when they weren't paying anything, cause it was about the coaching and the mentoring. And then as money goes in, then all of a sudden you're a woman, you're an Asian woman. I remember being so prepared for my uh, press conference um, at Colgate, I had everything answered in terms of statistics. And then there, then the first question was, well, what is it like being, you know, a woman, a female AD? And I, I had no, I was stumped. <laughs> I was not prepared to answer that when that was, um, you know, a really big deal. And so for me, I, I just did my job and get to that position. But now when you're in that position, now, you know, Jennifer, Adia, we, you, LaChina, we cannot make mistakes. We make mistakes, you know, that may be the next hire, they're, they're not going to look at someone that looks like us. And I think uh, women entering into the field understand that and have to decide, do they want to take that responsibility? And I think we have to explore those challenges. Like we have to have those conversations about the added stress, pressure, scrutiny. Um, you know, how many times do we say, oh, this woman ended up losing her job. They're not going to hire another woman there now. Right. Or, you know, this black woman didn't get it done. There's no way they're going to hire another black woman. And we just completely assume that they're going to go in a different d direction. But success is not tied to your gender or your race, right? But you feel that way when you're mm -hmm. one of the few that, that's in these positions. Um, Jennifer, I want to change gears a little bit and talk a little about women coaching men's sports because, whew, I mean, as we're reading all of these numbers, I mean, it, it gets even more slim when we have that conversation. I'll share a few with you here. Women are just 6% of head coaches of men collegiate teams. This is all sports. Women hold 4% of the head coaching positions of men's division one, team, division one teams. Women held 5% of the positions in division two and 7% division three. Now, um, I had a conversation previously with Tara Vanderveer, who I know is one of your mentors, uh, Adia, but something she said to me, I thought was really fascinating. You know, she said, that's fine. If we have 50% women coaching women's sports, and 50% men coaching men's sports, then we need to focus on 50% of men's sports being coached by women. You know, it's like, she's like, it, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing scenario where all women should coach women and all men should coach men. She said, if, if they're coaching half of our, our sports, then we should be coaching half of theirs. And so Jennifer, I, I'm just curious when you hear those numbers and think about your road or a Becky Hammond why don't we have more women coaching men's sports? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, a lot of it comes down to, I think, the, the stereotype, you know, that we had that women can't coach men because you can't relate, which was something that you never saw, you know, the opposite of, which was always interesting to me. They always say that about women, but you never hear that about the guys coaching women. Um, right. But, you know, on the football side of things, it's a little different just because obviously football is not a traditionally – um, not a traditional sport played by a lot of women, which is, is actually growing now with all the flag football programs. So I think that is hindered as far as the football side, but in basketball, I think it's a lot of, you know, it's just how it is type thing. And, you know, we've, we've been willing to settle with that and the people making decisions have been willing to, to also go along with that. As you said, you know, we hire people that look like us. And I think on the men's side of things, for so long, we just kept hiring guys and kept hiring guys just because that's how it was. And no one was willing to, to be different and rock the boat, you know, for a great female candidate, even though, you know, they could definitely lead their team. 
What did it take to rock the boat for you? Like, what did it take when you look at your journey? How did you get there with so few numbers? Yeah, I mean, it, it took a lot as far because I was a successful basketball coach. You know, life was good. We won a national championship and I just walked away to go coach football. So I think it, it took a lot within me to do that. But ultimately, I had to be willing to be the representation I didn't have. And that's, you know, once I made that decision um, that it was OK that no one looked like me doing what I wanted to do, that I could be the first to do that. Um, I think my mindset changed and I really just started, um, you know, this crazy work ethic and, and meeting the right people to get to where I wanted to get to. And there's also this perception, which I'll be interested in you guys thoughts on this. There's this perception that coaching men's sports is like the highest level of where you want to be. Right. And maybe I'm wrong in the way I think, because I've only covered women's basketball and that's been by choice. I've been offered football. I've been offered the NBA, all those things, but I wanted to be here because I want to build this sport and I want to build this environment for women and get more media traction and really be a part of this. But there's always this sense that if you're coaching a men's team, then that's when you've really made it. Like, oh, Don Staley should leave women's basketball to coach in the NBA. Yes, there's more money, but as you hinted at earlier, Vicky, that's not always what it's about. Is that something that we need to change, Adia? Like, do you see that hierarchy being a, a little bit of, a, of an issue as we look at the value of men's versus women's sports? Yeah, but it's all monetarily. So I think that when you see when you have, and that is a mindset, that's like the perception of scores, but it's all about money. So I guess an example is, um, and I think Don, um, you know, I think a lot like Tara, I, I think that, so let's put it this way. If Tara Vandiver was a man, how much money would she make? <laughs> she would make about 7 million a year, right? Yeah. So it, it's just completely different. So the money is what kind of drives it. And if in most men, if they're coaching women, they would coach men if they had the chance to at the same level in a heartbeat. Most aren't coaching to grow the game or or um, mentor women. So it's more like a job. So and, and I'm generalizing, but just in general. So I think that it's important. It's important to to do it. I think, you know, Jennifer, that's hard to take a leap of faith and go do something I didn't even know The you know, you know, running backs coach. I, I was on this other panel. I didn't know there was any women's agents in the NFL. So we have to, to break that trend. But I think that also, I think some things that it comes down to too is finances there. It's not fair. If you look at his, how successful Don Staley is. Yeah. So the men's program isn't as successful mm -hmm. at her school, but a man can come in at three times the pay. Like I don't, that's not really fair. And I get that, you know, some men's programs are bringing in more money, but it's just not the disparity. The disparity is so great. And we saw that this year with the final four, it's just glaring. It, there is just so many inequalities financially. Once that changes and there's more equity, there's more re revenue sharing, there's more points and all those things that we saw at the final four, then you're going to see more growth because an example is us going to the final four, my program. If I was a man, I would, if I was a men's program, I would have brought back millions to my university. So you have more leverage, you get more resources, you get more stuff, right? More money invested, sorry. Um, but then, but us, because of no unit sharing, I didn't bring back a dollar for the program, for the mm. school. So it's just, that has to change because once there is more money um, being made, then it's just, I think, you know, money, it just talks and it drives a lot of things. Yeah, you bring up a great point. I mean, in value. And we're going to get to the NCAA tournament in, a, in a just a, a moment because we definitely have to dive into that. But, you know, and Vicki, I don't want to put you on the spot, but in terms of- I'm used the, to it. <laughs> <laughs> it turns good and you're, and you're good at it. So I know you can handle it. Um, but in terms of just that value structure behind the scenes on the administrative side of things of women's sports versus men and marketing dollars and exposure and all of those things, what are we missing there? Like what, where do we have to get to for the value structure to be a little more balanced and between men and women's sports? Sure. And it really does come down to Adia hit it, a money game. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's where title nine comes in because, um, to, to equal it out, 
um, because of those receiving federal funding, which uh, most all universities, if not all, uh, receive. And so it is, it is the, the almighty dollar where you see men's basketball bringing in billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then you made a great point, Lachana, and I'm so glad that you are sticking with women's basketball because there is growth there and trying to get the media um, and attention towards women's sports because the stories are there. Yeah. People just need to see it and become fan crazy. Yeah. Um, and I see it. I, you know, I'm a volleyball player, but I don't miss a, a, a women's uh, basketball final four. I don't. I love it. I love the atmosphere. I love the crowd. I love, uh, you know, getting to watch like every game. That's exciting to me. Um, and I didn't grow up with basketball, but I'm a huge fan because I love it. We need more of that. And, and from an athletic director point of view, it is imperative that our successful coaches, uh, men or women, but especially women, that we compensate. But it is tough to compensate during a time with budget and everything else. Um, and in terms of just marketing and, and people seeing, when it comes to marketing, it's equal. Everything, um, especially I think in the collegiate area. However, the women's basketball, Final Fours and men's basketball, that was uh, very disappointing, but people see it now. I would never see such um, uh, people's reaction on social media. That's only yeah. gonna help women's sports um, because men and women, you know, NBA players, WNBA players, they spoke against that because everyone can see it. And student athletes, especially, they love it, it, equity. Like if, if a men's team is getting four pairs of sneakers and the women are getting two, they're going to start saying something and they're yeah. willing to give up. You know, it, it, so that is, I think, crucial, but it is tough to fight the market because when you're doing a search, there's a certain salary that you're going to, it's gonna be um, very high for men's basketball. And women's basketball, it would be considered high, but not equal to the men's. Yeah. Right, you know, and so. Yeah, I mean, and, and you bring up a lot of really good points. First of all, thank goodness, there's a new generation of young women that have come along that are going to pull the cover back, right? Like they're going to get on social media. They're going to say, this is what we don't have. This is what the men have. Because for many years, and even myself, you know, we were taught as women, be grateful. You have a tournament, you have a team, you're a part of it. You should be happy, right? But there seems to be this movement now of, no, we don't want to just be a part of it, we want equality. And we'll get to the NCAA tournament, I promise in a moment, but I, I believe that it's the external view of women's sports that has to change. I think those of us that are in it, athletic administration is starting to understand, we're gonna get to that whole, we'll get to that in a second as well, but I think it's the marketing, the media, the sponsorships. When you sit in those rooms and you say, okay, you've got a million dollars, how much do you want to give to the men versus the women? Of course, because they think that the men are that much more popular or they have better stories and they have better exposure, which they probably do get all that. They're saying, I'm going to put all my money into the men. But what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Put the money into the women and see where the popularity go, put, goes. Put the exposure into the women and see what happens with the growth of the sport. If no one sees it, almost like what we talked about earlier with role models, they can't believe it. But this season, we had all of the women's games for the tournament on television. There was no whip around coverage. You can watch every game beginning to an end. So that grows the space and opportunity for someone who's watching to say, I connect to this player or I connect to this team's story or wow, I did not know Adia Barnes was back coaching her alma mater. I, I need to follow. I need to support. But it starts with the eyes. It starts with the value system where I think is actually where we need to see a lot of change. 
Okay. I didn't know if anyone wanted to add on to that. No, I mean, I think I, I absolutely agree. And I think when uh, most colleges, when they're looking at it, I do they believe they distribute it equally. For me, it's important to get our women's team out there for people to view. Yeah. If you watch a DIA coach, it's exciting. Like you want to get in there and you just want to see what's going to like kind of come out of her mouth in a, <laughs> right. in a huddle or anything like that. I mean, I was hooked and, um, I, you know, again, relatively new to basketball, like I didn't see it until I started watching the games, Yeah, you know, and then the story speaks for itself. Like the sports speak for itself. Yeah. No matter what gender and providing that so we can watch it that was huge yeah it was huge i mean to have five million people watching that game and the other thing with china just think about when you started there was carolyn peck i mean there wasn't a lot of you <laughs> like there weren't black females at your level like you've kind of created this but it wasn't there and you pulled some other people along but none of that was like that 10 years ago remember i was in media with the storm it just wasn't like that i mean there was carolyn peck and um, you know, um, Kara Lawson was playing. So, you know, and she was doing ESPN, but there was no one else. So I think things are starting to change, but even like um, as a mom, so I always challenge women because we don't support women. Mm -hmm. So, and, and there's a lot of factors. Didn't realize till I was a mom, as a mom, like right now I have two small kids, I have, you know, a baby that's nine months old. Mm -hmm. And then I have a six-year-old the time is harder, especially when we are the primary caretakers, even if you're married at a traditional household, whatever, you, it is not 50-50. It never is. Because as a mom, there's just so many more duties and organizations. So the time is sometimes a factor. So we are not supporting women. We aren't going. So I tried to be intense. I was like supporting softball. Uh, and I was like, look, that's the most softball I've watched this year. I was like, wow, this is amazing. But I'm trying to be intentional because we don't do it. Yeah. So I think that has to change. We like women's players have to watch the WNBA. You would be shocked at how many college um, female athletes they'll choose a male. So especially in basketball, they will choose. You say, who's your favorite player? 90% of them first will say a man, then they'll say a woman. Yep. So they're not even supporting the WNBA. They're not watching it. So I think that mindset has to change and definitely the, the revenue. I mean, you can't tell me that 5 million people are watching our, our final four game, our championship game, that there can't be some dollars made. There can be. And maybe in the beginning, maybe if someone pays $12 million to have a marketing package, maybe it's forced to have 2 million for the women. Yeah. It might be, but just like they do in every marketing, you may make someone buy a package and you make them buy the other and you include it. There is stuff like that that has to change and there needs to be more transparency because when there isn't, it's always like, oh, you don't make enough money. And honestly, Latina, I didn't even notice 90% of that until I was in it in the final four. I didn't recognize that during our sweet 16 round the floor, because it's always been like that. I didn't recognize that until people brought it to my attention. I'm like, oh, the men have that because I've never done a comparison because I'm so like, my focus is so narrow with my job and what I'm trying to do. I'm not like comparing the men and women until it's pointed out. And I'm like, wow, that's not fair. Because honestly, in the championship, in that run, it didn't feel like the deep into the tournament until the final four, yeah. then the floor, then people noticed. I was like, wow, you're right. Like <laughs> it, we just accept it here at Arizona. I don't say like, oh, the, you just, it's normal for the men's locker room to be better. It's normal for them to charter all the fights. Over my dead body, was I going to get the job and say, hey, you know, I'd like the same charter flights men. You couldn't pay me to do that. I would have never done that because you kind of learn as a woman to kind of stay in your place, pick your battles. That's what you're told all the time. Pick your battles. And I've done that. I'm not going to fight for equality when we don't make as much as the men. I just am not going to do that. So I'm going to try to build the program better, do what I can. But you're just kind of, you're, you're conditioned to be a certain way and to just kind of be quiet and kind of go with the flow. And that's how it is. And we all do it, including myself. Yeah, there was some research that came out, and I'm sorry I don't have the numbers right in front of me, that basically said that uh, a lot of women coaches are afraid to speak up about the disparities, uh, the gender disparities when it comes to, you know, issues of equality within their athletic department, because, 
you know, they don't know what the repercussions may be. And I don't know what happened to the certification process that we, we used to have, um, you know, where schools had to be deemed certified to say that they are compliant with Title IX. Like who is checking Title oh, IX? Like who is making sure that these schools are compliant there has to be something better in place. And there has to be more accountability and transparency to your point, Adia. Like now that what's happened at the women's tournament for those, I know I keep saying we're gonna talk about later for those that don't know, um, you know, there, there was a lot happening and it started really with women's college basketball where, you know, there were some pictures shown of the weight room for the women versus the weight room from the men. And then there were pictures of the men's food at their tournament and the women's food. And then there were, conversation about how the men had a space where they could go out and walk during these COVID quarantine times that we're in and the women did couldn't go outside. Like there were so many stories of, okay, this isn't fair. And it was very obvious from the outside looking in. So now hopefully those books will be open and the transparency will happen, but where is that accountability? And um, Adia, I wanna go back really quickly before we move into that structure of things with, with Vicky, you talked about moms, right? And as we're looking at the declining numbers of women in coaching, how does the lack of accommodations for mothers really fit into this and in, in whether or not they decide to continue with their coaching careers? It's, it's pretty devastating. Like it is very challenging. Um, I created a village, but I, I had to do that. <laughs> it wasn't like I just had it and I had so much support. It just kind of happened. Um, we don't have support. Um, people aren't, um, they're not doing it. I know so many women that have left the business because they can't do it or they're not supported or they're treated a certain way. So we get out of the business. Um, I had a friend during the final four run, a prominent coach at a very big um, institution who was so discouraged during that championship. Her team was going to go very far, almost was thinking about quitting. And I'm like, don't quit. We need women like you get your own program and you can make a change and you can, it's easier because you can dictate your schedule a little bit more. Like I can say I'm going at 9.30 and drop my kids off. Like I can dictate a little more, maybe I say a little bit later, but there's just no support, um, there isn't. During the final four or during the whole tournament run, the three weeks, I had like, we were in quarantine with two kids. It was very hard. Luckily my floor, I have an administrator that's a mom. I have, you know, I, she brought her son to help me. Like I had all these people helping so my son could run like crazy on the floor, but it was like, there was no space to even go outside. And so it, it's, we're always an afterthought. There is no thought for a mom because there's very thought for a woman, but then a mom, there's no support because no one is moms making those decisions. There are none. So we talk about women administrators. It's rare, like with like a, a family also on top of that. So it, 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 it's not even known, like at the final four, it became viral that I breastfed. But that, it wasn't like I chose to break, breastfeed at halftime because of the timing and nowhere to go, it's kind of, I, as a as necessity, I had to. Then it went viral and I was like, whoa. I was like, that's what I always do. To me, it wasn't a big deal. And to everybody else, I was like, that's crazy. But like, if I talked about all the reality, like at, on recruiting trips, going in my car with the lighter plug, like there's nothing. Like even at the championship game of China, if you were a new mom, where would you, where would you have pumped that? you would have had to go in the bathroom. Like there's nowhere, you would have to go in the bathroom when people are walking it out. And maybe you find an outlet near the wall, you would have stood there and pumped. So there, it's never a thought. And I'm not saying like we can go change everything, but even if someone like rented one of those portable pumping stations, the women would pay. I mean, I've had so many reports, you don't understand the messages and calls I got just talking about it. It was like, people were so thankful I talked about it. I was like, I was, that's what happened. Like I'm pretty transparent. So it wasn't like I, said, oh, I'm going to talk about this. I said, this is what I'm dealing with. This is our reality. To me, it was like, that's the norm. And so I think that it's just, it's not even a thought. It's not talked about. And I think it's also, I have to be very conscious as a head coach and a mom. And I, I have to be intentional because of, I know what I do and I know how challenging it is. I have to not say, okay, when I'm hiring this woman, don't worry if she's a new mom. Because I know the time and I know the constraints because it, it's very easy to, as a mom to say, oh, I want a single person with no ties. It's very easy to do that even as a mom. So I can't imagine if I was a man, just imagine that. So sometimes as a mom, I'm like, gosh, if that position is just a single younger woman, she can yeah. just go out on the road more, right? 
So I have to check myself and say, oh, Adia, like you're that person. Like, you know, because it, it's just kind of the reality. Yeah. So we, we don't have any support, like no support. And my school's been good, but also when I first had the baby before the season, I didn't leave it as an option. So I didn't go and say, can I? I said, oh, I'm traveling her if I'm coaching. <laughs> like, yeah. So I, I had to be very intentional and say, this is what I'm doing. I'm paying for it. It won't be a thing. Like it's separate. I'm not asking for money, help or anything, but this is what I have to do. So I didn't leave it up for a discussion because if I would have left for a discussion, I maybe wouldn't have been able to do it. But it is a discussion that needs to happen, that is happening more. And a lot of it stems from you pumping at halftime of the national championship game. Like I know it probably wasn't ideal for you, right? Because that's a private part of what you do as a mom, but I know how you are too. You're very yeah, authentic. Sure. And, yeah. But the number of women in business, in finance, in sports, in right, every field that were tweeting saying, wow, we're so glad that this is coming to the forefront because many women don't know how to even start that discussion of this is what we need to be good at our jobs and to be the best that we can. And you open the door for that to happen. Speaking of kind of accommodations, Jennifer, I'm, I'm curious on your end, like how can men's sports be more accommodating and welcoming in the way that they're set up when it comes to women uh, coaches? Because one thing we often hear is, oh, you know, they don't have a locker room for the women in men's sports, or, you know, there's just different things about the way they've always done things in men's sports that aren't welcoming to women coaches. So what are some of those things that you think should be considered in order to make it more attractive? Yeah, I think uh, one thing I will give the NFL, you know, the accommodations have been great. Each stadium is required to have an, a locker room for female coaches. And I mean, they're all uh, equal as far as I know you know they're all nice and have everything that you need um, but when I was working in college um, like at Dartmouth uh, I never had a locker room <laughs> you know no nowhere we went had a female locker room so I would just hop in the bathroom or you know whatever I needed to do but you know I didn't a lot of these stadiums are older so they just never had anything for accommodations for for women but the NFL has been great um, which you know I, I tip my hat to them and I think you know just because women are, are new in the league now people are just trying to make sure they get it right so even down to equipment guys you know they're always asking making sure I'm good um, which is nice because when I started like we talked about earlier in Carolina and like I didn't know if I could go to equipment and ask oh like my shirt's a little big. Can I get a smaller shirt? Like I was almost like, I'm just going to wear it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go ask. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, in the NFL, you know, you, you essentially have not because you asked not, but I was, I was unsure if I could go ask or, you know, I didn't want to look like I was being extra because, you know, you know, I didn't want to rock the boat anyway, but um, you know, DC has been great and everywhere that we've been around the league has been great as well. That is wonderful to hear. Very, very good to hear that they've been welcoming. All right, so kind of like our last pocket in this conversation, I've kind of put it off, um, is the administrative side, whether it's NCAA, you know, the, the conference level um, uh, of administration, um, you know, the individual schools, athletic directors, whatever have you, how do we get more diversity in those spaces so that we essentially have more diversity in decision-making when it comes to hiring coaches? And, um, you know, I've never looked at the structure of the NCAA to say, okay, over women's basketball, like, what does this look like? I know there's oversight committees. The NCAA is basically made of its member institutions, right? So, you know, you've got presidents, you've got FARs, you've got, you know, all these committees and all that. But, but Vicki, how do we penetrate with so many levels of, of leadership in college athletics? How do we penetrate that in order to get the diversity we need to make better hiring decisions? Sure, a great question. And, you know, in response to just our discussion, those of us, male, female, white, black, Asian, we just need to do a better job in leadership and, and equity. Yeah. You know, we shouldn't, I don't want uh, a, a Dia to go all this through her head while she's coaching for a championship, wondering how to explain and I'll pay for it. Like we need to communicate and we need to stress to our, especially our female coaches that you are supported, like talk to us. Yeah. You know, I, I would have, you know, had, had a, a breast machine, like in, in a second. Yeah. Right. Um, and I don't have kids. So I, you know, even though I'm a woman, I don't know what motherhood goes through. So I too try to talk 
um, to our coaches. And that's so key. And we have to let them know, the whole department know that that is supported and that is uh, huge for us. And so that's Mark Emmert, that's everyone in the leadership role at diversity, hiring, hiring women coaches, supporting women's team is vital for our department and organization, flat out. And we have to show it. If we say it and don't show it, man, that's bad. So yeah. I think we need to start showing. Yeah. I, I think that is going to get us there and we need to start doing. I mean, our four AAPI group, I mean, we've been talking, Pat and Amy and I have been talking about it for years. We didn't do anything until now. And so let's go, right? Yeah. The time is now. Tell us a little bit about that group and why you started it and kind of the mission and how that's going. Sure. Um, well, I used to think that I would just, if I saw any Asian coach or uh, at an administrator at a convention, I would just go and introduce myself. Um, and, and there were just so few that we already had our few group, but it actually has increased and really wanted to create an organization that they felt comfortable, a safe space, but also where we can help them um, get jobs and professional growth that athletics is a great area, uh, a profession for, for Asians and, and minorities and women to prosper. In. Yeah. I mean, it, it, is, it is a lot of fun. And so um, not having an organization that specifically worked for, especially for AAPI, we thought it was time. And, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, we're going to grow um, authentically. And um, I, I can't tell you where we'll be even just a year from now, but it's a start. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, where we all need to go. We need to keep changing and change is hard for people. I realize that Yeah. in an athletic department and you will get called out for breastfeeding. You will get called out for all kinds of things, but we just need to keep going, especially those in leadership roles. We must, must, must um, do our part and not just the women and minorities. It's like everybody. Yeah. And I do believe for the most part, the leaders are ready. Well, ne nearly 80% of athletic directors running college sports across all divisions, that's one, two, and three, are men. 67% white, 8% black, 3.8% other, with 20% being women. And of those 20% that are women, 18% are white, 2% women of color, athletic directors at all three levels. So those are some numbers to go along with what you're saying that not only do you need to get better when you be better when you get those positions, but we've got to diversify in our hiring in order to change some of the trends. Now, I want, to, I want to end with um, what's going right. What things have gone right for you along each of your journeys that have gotten you to where you are? That could be mentors. It could be you know, something, the way your athletic department is structured. What are those tools, those resources those words of advice, whatever, whatever you want to share with our audience um, that has helped all of you three trailblazers who are just so inspirational and have been inspirational on this panel today to get to where you are. Jennifer, I'll start with you. What are, what are some things that have gone right along the way that we can learn from? I think uh, you know some of the biggest things that have gone right for me are the, the men who I've worked for. They've been great allies for women in sport, uh, for women in football. And, you know, I definitely wouldn't be here today without them. Coach Rivera, Coach Stevens at Dartmouth, uh, Coach Neuheisel when I worked out in Arizona. Um, they were all great. And they brought me on for what I brought to their, their teams, not because I was a female. They weren't trying to parade me around or anything like that. Uh, they brought me on for the value that I brought. And I'm thankful for that. And we need more of that. We need more ally. We need more guys speaking up about issues even though it doesn't affect them. You know, I think it's important for men's college basketball coaches to speak up about things that are going on on the women's side, just because we need that, that allyship to, to be there. And, um, you know, to be in this football business as a female, um, it can definitely be tough to get here. You know, like I said, I've been fortunate to have great mentors and allies, but 
Um, you know, it's wide open right now with the Women's Coaches Forum that the NFL has with Sam Rappaport. There's so many avenues to learn more about football and to get into football if you want to get in. And, you know, I always tell people, you know, the sports business is, is tough and um, the wheat get eaten. But if you want to do this thing, you know, really put the work in to get here and create opportunities for yourself. And when you get those opportunities, it's up to you what you do with them. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm available for any advice. People want to get into football um, just to try to help each other out. I'm always here for that. So, um, but I'm thankful thankful for the people who've helped me get to where I am now. And I look forward to seeing, you know, more people that look like me getting opportunities in the future. Love that. And yeah, shout out to Sam Rappaport, who does a fantastic job um, with the NFL with women and women of color. All right, Adia, how about you? What's gone right? A lot of things have gone right. Um, it's been amazing to me, all the love and support from former players, from women, from women of color, um, it's been, you know, I honestly cried at my press conference. I was sad about losing, but I honestly, in my heart, I felt the weight of being sad because I was a woman, because I was a former athlete, a black female. I felt all that. I was honestly more sad that I couldn't do it because of all those things like moms and representing all those areas. But um, so much love from all these different groups. All those I felt weight, I felt um, a sense of, um, I, I was inspired, I was motivated, I was more hungry to win because of all that stuff. Like, wow, you're the first one with the infant, you're the mom, this, that. So it like, it kind of lit my fire. And so I was like, we're doing this. I was probably more passionate and pumped because of all that. Um, and just like that I can inspire a change. I never thought about that I was gonna create that. It just happened because of my situation. And so if I can inspire someone to stay in the business, or to go for it, or they see a former player leading or a black woman or a mom, if I can inspire one person, I've done a great job. So I'm never gonna win enough games. I'm never gonna be as successful as I can because no one's gonna probably win 11 championships like Gino. And so it's not gonna happen, but if I can inspire along the way, if I can, you know, China, like you're in a busy career, if I can inspire you, oh, I wanna have kids one day and you see that or someone else, then I, that's a great feeling for me. Then I've made a difference. So, um, you know, I, I have had support, right? even though I've created, I've talked about stuff and Arizona has supported me. Um, I've brought attention to the inequalities of us traveling and my infant counting when she doesn't count. So that has sparked conversation and it's helped other women. So I am, um, I'm humbled by that. And I'm, I'm happy that I've been, been able to, to cause a conversation and some type of change. So, um, you know, I'm doing my job. Well, I'll tell you, we often feel like to inspire, there has to be this intentionality that happens and we've got to reach out and try to touch so many people. But oftentimes inspiration comes from just being who we are. Yeah. And through you living your truth, where you are, the things that you're experiencing every day, those challenges, the wins, the losses has definitely sparked conversation and it's creating change. So congrats to you and thank you for that advice. All right, Vicki. Yeah, it you know, mentorship and support. It gives you resilience. It gives you passion. I mean, I love what I do. It is the hardest thing ever. But, you know, you, you know, I have a stack of folders or emails or just if I know I'm having a bad day, I know who to call and they're in the business. And, you know, it's women supporting women. And it's so exciting because we get to do what we get to do. And that is influence young people, right? And then you get to work with unbelievable coaches and, and, and bring your team and administrators and be part of that change. Like I love, you know, when I'm long gone that hopefully they don't go back and go, wow, that was a terrible decision. You know, I want to be part of the growth of, where I am collegiate sports and what we stand for. So, um, you know, and I get energy, like this panel has just made my day. Like, and I love it. Cause I, I've never met any of you in person but I feel that we're connected and that that's through sports. We are 100% connected, and this has absolutely been such a great panel. I've been inspired and re-energized listening to all of you and your stories and your journey. So Vicki, Jennifer, Adia, thank you so much for what you do and carrying on what Billie Jean King really wanted many, many years ago, which is to create more avenues and opportunities for women in, in our 
49th celebration of Title IX. We have come a long way, but we still have a ways to go. And thank you for all of you for taking on that mission and that responsibility to pave the way for those coming after us. Um, so thanks so much to all of you. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us for this important conversation. Uh, to the Women's Sports Foundation to, to understand and know that we have to talk about these things in order to create change. And uh, thanks for allowing me to be your host. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.